Hallo und herzlich willkommen zur heutigen Nachmittagssession unseres Intersystems AI und ML Summits 2021. Mein Name ist Uwe Hering und ich werde Sie jetzt als Moderator durch diese Session begleiten. Ähm, da unsere beiden Referenten leider noch kein Deutsch sprechen oder nur ein bisschen, werde ich jetzt ab, auf Englisch weitersprechen. Um, I'm very thankful that my colleagues Eduard and Sergey um, have agreed to support us with their extensive technical expertise. Um, both gentlemen are experienced uh, sales engineers from, you guessed it, beautiful Russia. So, hello Russia. Hi. Привет. In this session, um, they're going to introduce us to uh, a co essentially a community of AI and ML practitioners. Uh, which goes by the name of uh, Convergent Analytics. Um, it is on GitHub, and uh, Sergey is just showing a couple of links that uh, speak to that. Um, in my understanding, which is admittedly very limited, this community seeks to develop analytical tools and solutions that combine multiple analytic tool sets and approaches, including AI, ML, and or BI, and many others, in one single analytic process. Um, please know that you can ask your questions uh, about conversion analytics uh, at any time in either the chat or the question panel in your GoToWebinar UI. And uh, we will address your questions um, at the end of this presentation. With that, I'd like to hand things over to Sergey and Eduard. Guys, the floor is yours. Thank you, Uwe. I pick up the floor and um... My name is Sergei Lukianjigov. Uh, let me quickly share my screen. Back. Here it is, yes. Hopefully now, hopefully now you can see the agenda that we would like to take you through today. And uh, despite the, 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 the wealth of the points that uh, we have with us, and, uh, like Uwe has just said, we are um, speaking on behalf of Convergent Analytics community that is um, an internal and also external community that unites uh, both uh, the... That, that unites both the um, external and uh, internal folks uh, the, that are interested by the um, in-platform analytics topics. So uh, today we would like to just touch the three points of the, of the, of the whole multitude of, of information that is exchanged through that community. And those points will be uh, productive AI ML, a platform required. So we'll quickly go through the points that we consider interesting when we discuss a platform for productive AI ML. We will show a live demo on a uh, prototype that is actually running behind my, my PowerPoint right now. And we will do it in, in a couple of roles. Uh, we'll play a distributed scenario. Some, some cal computations will be executed locally on my machine and, and the other part on Edward's machine and then we'll compare the results and we will very briefly present a cross-industry scenario that uh, probably would speak to most of us that deal with any product that that has a distinguishable product life cycle. So with that let me take us through the considerations about the AIML platform. So when we were speaking about uh, real-time AI ML, uh, very, most of the times we are concerned with the following questions. Are we satisfied with the creation and, and adaptation speed versus the speed of change of uh, AI ML mechanisms in our company? How well, how well our AI ML solutions support real-time decision-making? And whether or not our AI ML solutions can self-adapt, that means can they continue working without involving developers? And can they adapt to a drift, or a change, uh, non-predictable change in, in the data, or even in uh, ch change in the uh, decision-making approaches and practices? So uh, we are 
am proud <laughs> to to state that uh, InterSystems Iris is an AML platform, and um, I'm presenting a quite classical picture with uh, uh, InterSystems Iris in some detail in, in the middle, and then on the on the left and on the right we have uh, a number of third-party applications that uh, make InterSystems Iris a real-time AML platform. So first of all, on the left uh, margin, uh, we have uh, in the bottom of the left margin we have. Uh, three all-purpose mathematical modeling tool sets python r and julia and right above uh, we have the logos of uh, two specialized uh, frameworks for automated ml auto ml so-called h2o and the data robots all those uh, mathematical modeling environments uh, can be orchestrated and managed from within InterSystems Iris. Uh, on the right uh, of that slide, on the in, in the right margin, I'll start from the bottom. We, of course, we we should mention Iris Studio, so our own development client, development environment, followed by Jupyter. So anyone who has touched the topic in, in, in practice, touched the topic of data science, and, and knows this. This is one of the most popular uh, AML uh, content editor. Uh, we have uh, integration with uh, Visual Studio Code and Eclipse. And finally, uh, everything of this is also interacting with GitHub. So um, if we now uh, continue in terms of uh, DevOps uh, with three distinctive layers, continuous deployment, the CD, continuous integration, CI, and continuous training, which is the, the, uh, the closest match for continuous testing in, in classical uh, DevOps in, in, in machine learning, we will, we will replace that testing by training, because actually training is the actual test of the quality of our AML mechanisms we are designing and deploying. So if we, if we, if we start from the CD, continuous deployment components so of this macro model, we see that we can, we can take samples of data uh, and also existing or new ML mechanisms. We can work with them using Jupyter, like most of the data scientists people would do. Uh, in Jupyter, we have a possibility to apply our mathematical modeling environments and their respective languages, Python, R, Julia, and the artifacts that we produce, uh, which most of the times will be models, but not only models, there can be a variety of different uh, things that we would like to uh, develop uh, on, on the data science end and then deploy in the platform, we can send all that into into Iris platform, right? So this this link, this integration is by be bidirectional. We'll we'll see the, the also the, the arrow going from Iris into Jupiter in a second, but uh, uh, it's important to 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 know here, and that's the I'll say the the essence of this um, component is that. We can uh, continue working in the, in the mode and uh, the way we were used to do it as a data science team, but now we can deploy our AIML mechanisms in the precise portions of Iris platform automation processes. Automation process uh, that correspond to the second layer, the continuous integration layer. So here we uh, are implementing the, 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 the most important logic of practically any AIML solution. That means we are consuming real-time data or logical time, near real-time data. We can consume static data like master data and anything anything we may need. And um, uh, this uh, consumption is assured by the uh, integration engine, integration uh, functionality of uh, Iris platform. And here you see the, 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 the arrow that goes from Iris back to Jupyter. So in case we need to borrow something already deployed in uh, Iris, we can use Jupyter to, 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 to make a copy or to edit directly in, in, in a specific place of a specific automation process in Iris, our Python or R or Julia code. And then comes uh, the turn for uh, organizing uh, from those data inputs. We have to organize them in, in a number of classical processing queues. Uh, in order to cope with real-time ML uh, dimension, we need to First of all, we need to be able to apply our models. So there is a queue of data for, in order for us to apply the application queue, uh, the data that we apply our models to. Uh, there, we need another queue for training, 
our models because um, each time we will identify the need to retrain, we'll probably need to play with the training data set, probably adding or completely replacing it with a newly arriving data. And finally, we need a spatial queue for controlling accuracy, the accuracy monitoring queue. The accuracy means the, how accurate our model stack is uh, providing what it is supposed to provide, forecasting or scoring or classifications and so on. So finally, uh, this makes our modeling stack work. And as a result, we obtain the outputs from this process, which we need to distribute to, to users. And again, we need to assure that we have uh, distribution mechanisms for model application results, all the different forecasts, all the different predictions, uh, scoring, uh, classification, sometimes maybe distribution tables, whatever our users may compute. So that's not necessarily machine learning outputs that we're talking about. So it can be any results of any computations that involve mathematical uh, tools. Those can be also the results of model training, and that will be mostly uh, important for data scientists, uh, part of the user audience that uh, would like to be sure that uh, this or that model that is uh, making part of this of that modeling stack is uh, has been trained properly and then also the platform itself ne needs to know whether or not uh, a particular model can can continue working or we need to retrain it and finally model accuracy monitoring results uh, we need to monitor somehow for example whether our prediction uh, several days after it matches the actual fact that happened and uh, that deviation from uh, the actual fact is is one of the important objects that we monitor not only that one but just to exemplify it in a most simple way so all those all those um, continuous integration mechanisms are assured by the platform and we are providing several templates uh, accelerating your development of all those constructs that we've discussed here so finally in, in the third layer, which is called continuous training, the CT, uh, we can say not much is happening, but the significance of it is really is really crucial. Uh, here we have the conversion of current models and model versions and the data set versions into retrained models and maybe even adjusted data sets. Because we are, let's not forget that we are in a real time context here. And the data is permanently changing and arriving, and we cannot keep it forever uh, since the since the beginning of times. So we will always be confronted with the necessity to intelligently change the data set we're using for modeling. And also, we most important, we need to from time to time we need to re retrain our models. And here we can do it using using the logic that we program ourselves uh, using Python or R or combination uh, of those with uh, iris functionality or in many cases uh, we can rely on uh, auto email frameworks like h2o and data robot to simplify certain uh, uh, model uh, conversion uh, and uh, even if we don't if we, even if we will not use immediately the outputs from those auto email frameworks we can always use those frameworks as trusted advisors to at least to tell us uh, whether what we have programmed manually, human-made models, are they making sense or they can be improved? And if yes, how? So um, to, uh, to, to sum it up, uh, InterSystems Iris is, uh, is the all-purpose real-time AIML platform that has no limitations from the point of view of the industries it covers. And we are in a cross-industry stream today, so we should mention uh, all the industries are equal in front of Iris. Iris, on the other hand, is um, uh, equally potent in terms of uh, implementing anything that can be formalized in terms of mathematics, just because of its capacity to orchestrate the really powerful uh, open source universal tools and also to very powerful AutoML tools. So we can say that anything can, that can be expressed as a mathematical task or even a logical sequence of steps in computing something can be implemented and it will be working in real time and uh, the platform will help you assure the autonomous running of those computations which is the very important end point of this um, part of our today's uh, discussion. So now um, 
it's time to take a look at Iris uh, in action. Before doing this, let me quickly introduce the scenario we will be uh, discussing and showing today. Uh, there are three main participants. So the first and the most, most important is the prototype itself, and uh, we personify it somehow because it, it, it runs now behind the scenes, and we cannot uh, intervene much in its work. Uh, but what we can do, and let me let me just say a couple of words about the prototype. So the prototype is about a factory, and in, in factory in the broadest term of this word. So this can be a real manufacturing facility. This can be a network of supermarkets. Uh, this can be anything else that is characterized by 24-7 real-time data feeds uh, that may come from sensors in the manufacturing world, that may come in completely chaotic fashion in public services when people are working with a public services portal or people are making purchases in, in, in a supermarket network. Uh, in this particular example, we are focusing on the manufacturing world and we are monitoring, our prototype is monitoring developing defects, so it's trying to estimate the probability uh, of potential equipment failures, raw material or finished good equality issues, human errors or even physical condition of the workers and so on. And it uh, helps to really save on the tedious work to support decision making on the course of action. So based on the outcome from predictive modeling, respective action is undertaken by humans, in this case, to avoid potential problems. So uh, the other two human participants today are a data engineer animated by myself that is supposed to be working at the factory. So this person uh, controls a defect detection system of uh, AIML agents, the agents meaning the flexible processes implemented in uh, Intersystems areas, and, we'll, and we will take a look at them in, in, in several seconds. So he launches and controls the functioning of uh, the set of those processes that we also call agents, and they perform the defect detect detection computations on real real time data feeds. Uh, data engineer also deploys uh, defect detection AML mechanisms that he receives from the data scientists. So he adds uh, new or modified AML mechanisms developed by data scientists to the processes and uh, accomplishes their uh, put into production. And finally, uh, he reports from time to time, and that's what we will do literally today in, in every detail. He reports trained models and training data sets for auditing to a data scientist. So he runs or schedules running a process that publishes for data scientists sanitized, and we consider uh, the data scientist uh, being an external kernel uh, person that has no access to our corporate network but still needs to be fully aware of how how qualitatively our models are working so we are publishing sanitized versions of tra trained models and data sets used for model training for the data scientists to audit them and finally the data scientist uh, uh, that will be represented by Edward today he develops like the name of the role suggests he develops defect detection AIML mechanisms for the agent system uh, he uh, then gives them to, passes them to data engineer to be embedded in the processes, in the productive solution, and he audits trained models and training data sets uh, from the defect detection system. So at this point, I will bring down my slides and I'll go to to my system here. So you can see already that uh, I've started from a dashboard and this is the dashboard. I'll sh say a couple of words about the prototype itself. So this is the dashboard that uh, is um, showing us the uh, um, predicted via actual results in the top left uh, corner of the dashboards panel. And in the bottom part, uh, in the left bottom part of the dashboards panel, we see the percentage of wrong classifications that is, and we've uh, reached at, at right <laughs> between the quotes moment when uh, the models that have, have been implemented are starting to lose it, their precisions and they start and the percentage of errors at, at some small portions of data, not everywhere, but small portions of data, uh, values that are close to one. So that means that a retrain will soon be scheduled. So let me take a look at the working folder. Uh, so it's not 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 yet launched, which is good. But I'll continue our 
our overview of the prototype. So there is another dashboard panel here. And by the way, all the, all the dashboards that I'm, that I'm showing, they are part of the standard functionality of InterSystems Iris. So they can all be developed in, in together with the analytical pipelines and together with the data structures and everything else. So that's pretty convenient and lets me, for example, in this case, uh, the possibility to control everything while not quitting the platform, all right? So the second dashboard panel is uh, the control of the training data set. And as you can see in the top left corner, the training data set is quite uh, experimental. So there was, there was an initial huge upload of something that we know for sure that represent a, a specific defect, but then due to reinforcement learning logic implemented in this prototype, uh, this prototype is adding new candidates for being considered as examples of the same defect. And some time after it, it reassesses their right to be present on the data set. And that's how the reinforcement logic is working in this prototype. So you can see on that graph that uh, certain patches are uh, more relevant for representing a specific type of defect that we're modeling. Some of them are less relevant, but that's uh, good. And we have a representative mix of different cases. Uh, can, uh, can, uh, confident cases, semi-confident and non-confident cases in order, in order to train our models. And finally, uh, we have another quite more technical dashboard that is showing us the content of the buffer, the, 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 the raw information that is coming to us from the equipment that we are connected to. And the, this equipment is a industrial kind of pump called feed pump that is used uh, in many, in many, on many occasions is used in energy industry uh, can be used in uh, water supply can be used in uh, manufacturing that can consumes water and on industrial scale and that pump has 45 sensors that every second deliver uh, a row of measurements of some physical parameters like uh, pressure like uh, rotor uh, vibration, uh, rotor displacement, uh, temperature of oil, and so on and so forth, so you name them. So those values we, we can see plotted uh, in the upper right quarter of the panel, uh, while on the left we see the statistics uh, on the um, time that is required to insert a hourly batch uh, in, in, uh, in the database uh, of uh, IRIS, because IRIS, apart from integration and analytics, it's also a DBMS, a database management system, quite performant DBMS. Reed Gartner on the subject won't we'll speak much about it. So we, we can also uh, rely on its uh, DBMS-centric uh, uh, capacity in order to automate, uh, automate all that. What's also important, we have a, a queue monitor that uh, actually shows us which processes in the solution are active now. So I can see that one of my interfaces to Python is being enabled right now. You see it's changed now. So now it's no longer enabled. The process is doing something without involving Python. So this picture is changing all the time. So Python is connected back. Uh, if, if it needs uh, R or Julia, you'll see those uh, interfaces enabled. They're called operations in Iris language. But what is, uh, I think, uh, more uh, illustrative is this. So we, uh, we have all the processes that represent our solution gathered in one, what we call production workspace. And the process, prototype itself uh, is composed of four processes. There is a process called factory generator that is uh, responsible for actually interfacing with uh, the equipment's SCADA or MES or just operating system of the equipment piece. We have uh, a, a process that is responsible for those queues that, we, that we've seen in, seen in the slide. It's called a buffer, buffering process. We have the most important uh, portion of the solution called a factory analyzer that implements the machine learning uh, um, kind of processes, sub-processes, uh, one of them being training, the other one being application of the, of the existing models. And we have another the fourth uh, process in the prototype called factory monitor. This one helps actually monitoring the accuracy of our modeling stack and is independent from, from, from the analyzer in this case. So all of them are interacting according to specific rules, but basically they, they can be considered agents in, in the scope of the solutions because each of them has their own logic and their own decision-making um, 
rules and machine sometimes machine learning decision making rules implemented in them so let me quickly show you so before so actually before doing before showing you the process uh, let me start something for edwards to be able to audit so let's not keep him waiting and we'll start a process called explore asia here and i'll explain a little bit about it in a second okay so let me quickly check it's feeling so what's what you see now here in uh, once i'm starting an additional process and I'm, it, it's a one-off process, all right? So compared to the four processes I've commented on previously, which work permanently, and they're working for several hours today, probably since morning time. So this one is one-off. This is just a, a process that will throw the latest contents of the training data set into Microsoft Asia. We're using this uh, channel as a communication channel with our data scientist, which is completely disconnected from our uh network of our factory and i can see in the visual log of the execution of this process so it shows me the execution of each particular step and i'll uh, comment on them a bit later how is it is proceeding i'm checking the working folder yes it's it's working so that's good so while it is working uh let me uh, let me uh, show you very quickly the analyzer process which is the major component of our prototype and as you can see so this process has a loop element so those elements are supplied together with the integration uh, layer of iris so you can use uh, the graphical process designer in iris to design uh, using using those pre-automated elements one of them being while loop there are different other types of loops that we're using while here and uh, once you launch that one you see that there are two major streams in here one is centered around ml training break and the other one is centered around ml scoring so the scoring meaning application of the models so those two are capable of working in parallel and uh, they implement one of them implementing model training so i can now go inside it and see uh, just the, the python content that is being changed to to our content in in the, in the midstream of the process so i'm using both uh, mathematical modeling environments to attain my objective of, of this training so this is r and thus in one of the elements uh, later mentioned later in the process i'm also using punctually julia so actually all three mathematical modeling environments are being involved in the execution as we speak and this prototype is working now and is performing its training using all the three mathematical modeling uh, environments which mean which is far from being necessary in most of the cases but in this particular prototype it's uh, the case so let me check quickly the visual trace here all right it's, it's progressing uh, and I'll be able to, and I'll be able to uh, trace its progress also on the Azure side. So this is my, this is my storage explorer in uh, Azure that we in, uh, in in the Azure workspace that we have shared with Edward in order to communicate, in order for me, not for me, for Iris, for the prototype to be able to uh, send him for auditing a certain portion of the data, and which will be picked up on. Edward's side on the data scientist side by a corresponding process in his iris and will be audited automatically he'll say a couple of words uh, very soon about it but let me refresh yeah it's working so I can probably continue with my story here so you, you can see that um, you can see that I can uh, execute and implement any logic in including this logic is this portion looks very linear but as you could see it in the previous steps it not necessarily can be like that and you can implement any thinkable forks here and the ifs and switches and so on so all the ppl notation implemented here is a kind of uh, macro comp composition layer in our um, 
a business process graphical designer you can use the whole power of it it's it's, it's, it's a kind of programmatic uh, graphical programmatic language if you like a low code programmatic language that allows you to implement above uh, the scripts written in uh, python or r uh, decision making logic that uh, helps you actually to automate the, the usage of your AIML mechanism. The, the, the uh, similar similar approach is in uh, scoring with the difference that here it's the whole sequence is a bit more uh, pragmatic so you just uh, you pick up the next portion of your data some batch of records and you predict using 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 the model regular object that has been trained by the training process training part of the process right so they are seeing each other's uh, artifacts and they can reuse them uh, let me check back the visual trace oh, sorry for it it will be all the way here today uh, switching there and back because we're in a live situation so hope you bear with us you, you can see that the uh, sending of the data to Asia has finished so let me just make a final touch and check it here so the last uh, the last timestamp for analyze a CSV file that uh, this process is sharing now with the data external data scientist is today at 13 uh, and three minutes that's the uh, Moscow's uh, time zones which is two hours in advance of uh, Europe uh, let me now refresh now let me just use the, the refresh function here all right so you see the 16 hours almost precisely and on my uh, watch it's 1602 so it's the timestamp that corresponds to the action executed by my uh, additional process that i've launched and that has extracted from the prototype the latest uh, state of the training data set and put it on asia so with that uh edward i will say i can almost ready to pass it to you so before doing it because you'll be auditing me i'll launch on my end my own audit using our integrated ML functionality that I'm pretty sure is covered in every thinkable detail by our colleagues today in this event and also probably the previous week for those that have seen it in the previous week so I'll just launch a sort of backup audit <laughs> using iris functionality with h2o playing behind it and I'll uh, pass the floor to you so I'm launching and you can take the screen from me or uh, Edward uh, thank you, Sergey. I launched my audit too. Okay. Um, here is my uh, work uh, dashboard, so to say. It's <laughs> uh, just aimed at audit, and I'm also running it. It takes some time, so I'll now explain uh, what's going on. Let's go back to a presentation for a little while. Um, uh, we are keeping with um, separation of concerns uh, between data scientists and data engineer. There are many reasons for that. Um, to start with, it might be required by law or regulations, uh, the more simple case actually, where uh, data scientists who can be an external, um, from external organization or just other part of your organization does not have access to the data for, for the training. Many reasons for that, the most simple one is uh, uh, if the data is a private uh, personal data, with um, data protections uh, uh, we usually for the better we're not distributing it anywhere and um, this way passing to the data scientist only anonymized version uh, of data or just some um, gen uh, generated data is just an easier is a um, batch solution other pro um, other reason for this um, distribution is of course that uh, data scientists and data engineer roles differ. Data scientists is a more research-oriented role with experimentation and uh, data engineer is more focused on running uh, the models in production without any problems and uh, ideally everything is done auto uh, automatically, the models are run, are 
uh, the, the predictions are inferred and uh, uh, quality checked and so on. In our example, we will show you the running model, well, so we already did, and uh, now we'll audit uh, from two different sides. I would uh, just check uh, the predictions from Asia uh, and uh, survey from the floor of a factory, so to say, can uh, check it with integrated ML. It goes back to our idea of, uh, well, not ours, but we participated in, in it, and Iris supports it as a distributed ML, which is more and more popular in uh, as a way to roll out your AI ML models, where you have um, different uh, hardware uh, running uh, models um, to save on latency times, because if you if you're doing uh, internet of things or if you're doing healthcare or many other industries finance you need to run your model as close as possible to minimize the timings um, again with uh, data protection where you have a factory or well some uh, some industry yeah, uh, where the data cannot um, leave the original system. And finally, more advanced models of uh, machine learning, such as neural networks. Uh, um, the issue with them, they yeah, give you great predictions, but they need a lot of data to be, uh, to be trained. And in, uh, in many situations, the data must be very specific. For example, if you're training neural networks about um, image detection, for example, you have some, um, some production equipment which produces uh, metal or really whatever, and it can produce uh, good uh, things or um, defective ones. And if you take photo, you take photos of defective ones, and you want to train your model to detect these defects so they can be um, automatically scrapped, right? That's, that's a good idea. And for for the better results, you need to train your model on the equipment, uh, on the materials produced from this uh, specific machine, because they differ in small ways between different. Uh, vendors and even between different uh, machines, different uh, factory floors. So you need to do final training on, on site. Uh, thankfully, neural networks are trained in Epoch, so you can do centralized training on your um, um, big instance with a lot of graphic cards and so on, and finish training at the um, factory floor with the uh, specific equipment uh, which works there. It's possible only really with distributed ML, because otherwise you can pipe all the data from each of your um, sites back into centralized uh, instance. And uh, it's also possible, but it's a lot more uh, trouble, especially if you want to keep the latency low. So InterSystems Iris supports all of that. Uh, we support local training and deployment of models uh, which were trained centrally. Uh, any frameworks actually with uh, community Python, R and um, Julia gateways, they just allow you to execute, execute the code, whatever, whatever it is in, in these languages. In our example, we are using Asia to a cloud to pass the data back and forth uh, between factory and uh, data scientist. Our clouds could also be used, or you can go uh, entirely offline. Well, I mean by using the, the intranet and not use the cloud at all. That's also an option. You have complete freedom of, uh, of choice there. Let's go back to the process. Edward Factory here. Uh, before you before you continue, can I show quickly that your uh, the process that you have initiated has created an Asia processing sure. job? Please take that. Steal your uh, for a second your screen, and I'll give it back to you in a second. Right. So 
So what I'm showing now is the uh, the screen from Asia, and it shows that at 1606, uh, that was quite some minutes ago, because uh, Edward took some time to explain uh, the mechanisms. His uh, task was received, uh, his processing task and his sendings, uh, he'll, he'll say in a couple of words uh, in, in a couple of minutes, his processing task has been received by Asia and it has been queued. Uh, so, um, it just quickly refresh, refresh it. Uh, it's running already, so Edward, for you to know. It's running mm -hmm. and uh, I, I'll give, back you the, give you back the screen to explain a little bit to our audience what you're doing. Thank you. Okay, uh, yeah, now, now that I see that the process I've started is working, let's see what, uh, <laughs> what your process exactly is. Um, so we have only one process and one operation for Python Gateway, Community Python Gateway. Um, and in the settings of our process, we have a Python operation to execute Python code and uh, work directory where to save various artifacts such as graphs and, um, and so on. Let's see what your process is doing. Um, the process is composed, as you have seen uh, from Sergey's uh, part of the demo, from individual activities, which, are, um, which can be executed in parallel or consequently. In this uh, scenario, I'm executing them one after another. Uh, to show you something interesting, we're piping the um, data to Asia uh, and creating a creating a job uh, on Asia side to train the model and to validate it. And I'd like to show you here. At the end, uh, after we get results back from Asia, we're building a graph and saving it to a, um, to some directory. Uh, as you can see, here is a variable substitution where we have uh, process uh, properties. We can also use request uh, properties or anything else really available in Iris. And on a Python side, let me. Oh, we haven't yet gone to that step, but uh, our example, yeah, you see that we are replacing uh, uh, these variables with um, real file paths. Another thing which I want to show you is passing the data. For data science work, it's important to pass the data from the database, uh, the data platform in our case, to your environment, Python, and or R or Julia, but I'll show you Python in this example, and to get the data back. So to pass the data inside, I'll uh, show you this one. Uh, so you need just to write an SQL query against InterSystem Series table. We can also uh, transfer tables, classes, or globals. Uh, uh, so you write a SQL query, it's a simple, most simple one, specify the variable on the Python side which you want to fill with the data, specify a data type, object type in uh, Python, like 95% of cases you want a Pandas data frame. And uh, that's it. Uh, InterSystem Cyrus does the rest by executing the query, iterating it, and building the data frame on um, on the Python side. On the other hand, yeah. when you Edward, quick alert, quick alert from the factory. Sorry to interrupt. Your your processing on Asia side has uh, been accomplished. We can we can see it. So just for you to know, please continue. But for you to okay, know. Okay, great. Yeah, you see we are on the next step and. Here, as we can see, the safe pick back to back to data. Uh, on the other uh, hand, after you uh, train the model and you want to get your predictions back, it's also possible with InterSystem Cyrus. Let me show you an SQL query. In here, we are inserting in into our InterSystem Cyrus table uh, from the select query. 
and the select query is run against pandas data frame which is you know kind of sort of a vir virtual table in most scenarios uh, so we are selecting from date frame and inserting it into our permanent storage in our case we're inserting uh, the predictions so this way you can um, uh, and do a bidirectional data transfer from InterSystem Cyrus to Python and uh, back from Python into Iris. Okay, that's, uh, as for, uh, Sergey said, that we have already have we already have some results, not all of them. Okay, this one is today's, yeah, just now. Uh, first result we see is uh, just log, not really something to to show, but very useful if something went wrong or to see that everything completed uh, successfully. And after a while, I think we'll have to wait a, a minute or two. We'll see our graph with um, our curves. Uh, while we are while we are waiting for it to finish, if I can uh, take quickly the screen to show some sneak sure. preview of the results, uh, <laughs> just uh, because I'll I'll show it anyway once the screen is fully back to me. So in in the factory itself, we already know that the accuracy shown by Azure modeling stack spoilers. <laughs> but let's wait till let's wait till you get the final uh, graph and we'll uh, uh, compare that one. This this of course is assuming the uh, certain let's say hyperparameter of uh, the modeling stack, which is the rate of regularization. Which is, I will not go into the details of it, but um, it's uh, put into some reasonably uh, central position, so we cannot cannot blame uh, ourselves for. Uh, putting Asia in an inconvenient sort of setup, but let's see what comes out on your end, uh, Edward. The screen is yours. Oh, uh, yeah, let me take back the screen. If, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You still, uh, you have received the graph then. Oh, yeah, I get a, I get a response, so let me, yeah, now you see that the output file is today, just a few seconds old. Let me open it. And you can uh, see the recurse comparison of accuracy between um, Asia and uh, InterSystem Cyrus. And Asia is a little, little better on this uh, specific uh, use case, Sergey. And do you have your uh, results of your audit with uh, integrated ML? Yes, please. So wait, let me switch now again the screen to me. And on my end, what we've done, we have an accomplished audit via integrated ML. This is the visual log and uh, the results are here. So we have uh, some for Iris performance, with, we should have the same number that you have but for h2o which is which is orchestrated by our integrated ml the accuracy is enormously high which yeah, may think it's a lot make of us think of an overfit <laughs> but maybe it's also true <laughs> who knows now so uh what's what's your final verdict data science and let's probably go further with our presentation and q and a's we can in InterSystem Cyrus actually use all three models comparing their predictions uh, from them in uh, a real time and uh, we can pick either one which in a recent time frame has shown the best results on validating data or we can actually just uh, pick all three models and um, use them as a true rate of sorts. So, Great. Mm -hmm. So, looks like we've passed the audit. Congratulations to everyone. Let's go. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Edwards. Thank you, Data Science. And I'm, and I'm also quitting my uh, data engineer role. 
to quickly go because we've spent quite some time on the demo and our time budget is not limitless. So as promised, let's take a look uh, very briefly at a cross-industry scenario that could be implemented in a, if not identical, but in a similar fashion on a real a real time data feeds. And this scenario, it comes from an actually existing prototype, by the way, uh, being implemented by one of our partners. And uh, this scenario is centered on actually <clears throat> monitoring and modeling uh, whether these or that item and items can be can be fashion retail items, can be um, some FMCGs and some said that those can be mobile phones. So anything, any human or robotic creation that have uh, a life cycle that needs to be traced in order to to be able to model further and predict further with more accuracy. For example, the volume of your sales. So in the central part of the slide, you see that in the, the upper part shows you the PLC agnostic forecast, uh, which is being taken away by the upward trend in, in, uh, shown by the orange line somewhere in the end of the observable period. But then there, there's, a, there's a sharp drop down. And the other, in the bottom part of the central portion of the slide, you see the PLC driven forecast that takes into account that this item has a specific fade in its life cycle. And this information uh, it helps the uh, time series model to direct the forecast in the right direction. And you see that in the end, uh, they meet each other and uh, the time series forecast is, is more adequate uh, given, given, the, given the actual behavior of sales. So this is something that um, in you have a lot of items, you'll need to do it real time and the, the sales uh, information will be arriving frequently. Um, you'll need to, tr to, to treat it real time and uh, the sooner you detect the change of phase in your items life cycle, the better it is for your analysts and for your actually other real time models that for example are predicting sales or doing some clustering on your customer database to take into account that information and to adjust their computations accordingly. So uh, with that, uh, I think over. I think we have some time uh, for some Q and A. Please, if you could assist us with any questions that we may have. Yeah, let me let me do that uh, in in a minute. Uh, thank you, first of all, uh, for a great presentation. I'm not going to um, you know pretend I understood everything you just showed us, but uh, I found it very interesting and. It's always nice to see um, the software in action rather than just speaking theoretically about concepts. So thank you for walking us through and uh, showing us uh, an actual life uh, setting. That was uh, was brilliant. Um, quickly going to check the chat. There is uh, there is a question. Um, is there is there some sort of a guideline on how to set up my own AI ML? landscape in in iris and in intersystems iris so apparently it's it's someone would like to have you know a step by step guide i guess i would say let me pick this one up uh, you see you see it uh, in in the list of the links there's the first link to our public uh, github repository of, of our convergent analytics community if you visit that one, uh, you will see uh, on the home page of the repository uh, the section called Downloads. And actually, in those downloads, they are listed in exactly the order you will probably need to follow in order to install your own landscape. You'll start from installing Iris. If you don't have your own license, license you have a download uh, link to, down, to download the Community Edition, which is a free of charge, no time limit. There is a data volume limit, so you can prototype and play you to the sandbox for as long as you need in order to to make up your mind and uh, based on that iris installation then you have the links to the repositories to python gateway r gateway and julia gateway all of them parts of the community ml toolkit project that contain a detailed documentation in order to proceed for those of you that would like to really uh, enter the user group uh, you can uh, drop us an email at uh, the address that is shown here in the slide, ML toolkit at intersystems.com, and we will add your GitHub account to our uh, this time private uh, corporate um, space uh, GitHub um, 
repository that contains slightly more information and more content, probably more updated, frequently updated content on uh, ML Toolkit, including also the installables of it. Uh, so um, hope this hope this covers it in in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's okay. Uh, uh, community convergent analytics public um, repository contains a list of webinars, articles, besides uh, the code itself, uh, and uh, learning courses, uh, interactive learning labs available in uh, several languages, including English and there are materials in German too. So uh, it's all public, check it out. And I'd also like to reiterate once again that uh, Python R and Julia Gateway are community projects available in Open Exchange, which is a catalog of intersystems based, open sourced, uh, community driven, uh, community supported projects. Thank you. And I second that statement. Um, it's always good to uh, take a look at these web pages. Um, they're frequently updated and have a myriad of uh, information bits and pieces um, that will guide you through your first projects um, so highly recommend that um, next question that somehow relates to the first one um, so how, how can an existing partner can get up to speed with AI and ML in iris uh, in, in, in you know in what I suppose the question is how, how fast can you uh, start doing what you just showed us, uh, Eduard? Uh, so the journey to AI mile, I think the most important part is choosing the right use case, which should be first of all simple because some advanced uh, AI ML use cases take a lot of expertise, very doable, but uh, um, challenging uh, and especially for a first project uh, so they must be simple as uh, proven to be solvable with um, AI ML technologies in the past or present <laughs> and they must uh, immediately affect your business by uh, bringing something else to your product to your end customers simplifying your operations uh, finding some new money on the table so to say um, yeah and if this uh, conditions are met uh, it would be much easier and much more effective to go from idea to proof of concept implementation uh, where intersystems can of course provide uh, help with that to finally working uh, prototype and to a production or operational um, prototype also if you're interested in a more uh, detailed answer. Check out the session uh, Kenos, uh, from Keno Software on this summit. It's, uh, it would be available as a recording where uh, their CEO talks about their journey. They're, they are an application partner. They, they, are, uh, they have a product for master data management and they edit AI ML capabilities to to their product and they talk about their journey to AML. Yeah, thanks uh, Thanks for that, Eduard. Uh, I, I second that statement. Um, Ludmila's uh, presentation this morning was very insightful. And um, as, you, as you mentioned, we will be um, putting out the recordings um, uh, probably on starting Friday um, and make them available through the event platform. So, um, check back in next week to, to see all these recorded sessions and especially the one from uh, Kano Software, which uh, talks about a use case. Although, Eduard, in all fairness, I wouldn't necessarily um, name Ludmilla's use case an easy or simple one. So um, my question to you would be, um, you said, you know, start with an easy to solve use case. Um, can you name a few examples of, of such use cases that, uh, that some of your prospects and, and customers might have uh, might have implemented. Uh, one use case which is fairly, if not simple, but uh, encountered in many industries is if you have uh, clients and they consume your uh, products and you have several products or services, then um, clustering uh, your 
clients into separate groups with the help of AI ML, with uh, clustering technologies, can help uh, immensely by uh, allowing you to provide a more personalized uh, experience for your customers. So, uh, for example, in marketing, you don't send the same um, list of discounts for everyone, but you first cluster your clients into separate groups. For each group, you pick the, uh, the discounts they would uh, enjoy the most and uh, send only them. Uh, clustering of uh, clients seems to be very popular and fairly simple thing to implement, but the talk is very industry and uh, company specific, so I won't say that there exists some one. The IML use case, which would help to start everyone, it's, uh, it's it would be great, but uh, I don't think it's possible. Yeah, th thank you for uh, picking a use case that I can personally relate to, So, <laughs> because I'm in marketing, for everyone who doesn't know. Um, and I guess that's a good question to follow up with your uh, statement. Um, we have a question. What are what are typical users of AI ML in Iris? And I suppose uh, the question is really uh, who, in terms of you know who whose job role is it to work with AI ML in Iris? Is it the data scientist? Is it? It will. Uh, let me just uh, overtake. Uh at this answer from you. It will slightly depend on whether uh, it's a partner or a customer situation. So in a partner's environment, most of the times you'll have, um, especially if this partner has a team that specializes on this type of solutions, you'll have uh, people with probably both DNAs, data scientists and data engineer, and maybe even developer mixed in one person. Uh, at, at the customer, we mostly see uh, a more clear distinction. So we have uh, people that are more developer, data engineer type, and then people that are more data scientist type. But again, this is not this is not black and white. This is uh, this can this can vary from one situation to another. And there are many customers, uh, especially the companies that are big enough that can uh, allow creating a sense of competence, and then they actually acting like small partners uh, for us by firstly developing this expertise and then helping to probably share that expertise in their network uh, in the industry. So in brief words, could, could be the answer like that. Yeah, so, so I think you could add, um, you know, people are able to learn as they grow, uh, sorry, as they move forward uh, within, uh, within the platform because it offers so many uh, possibilities and uh, makes access to AI and ML technologies um, so easy. Um, the last question I'm seeing in this, uh, in this question panel is, um, are there clients or customers of yours um, who are already using the ML toolkit in production? I think the question is, uh, is it meant for testing only or can, can, can it be used in production as well? We are privileged and uh, lucky to have uh, already several productive customers from those of them that have dared, and we're immensely thankful uh, to those people to, to actually not only recognize this, but also to share their experience. And there, uh, there's a video from the last year's uh, Global Summit uh, where- It was the year before called, uh, last already, it's okay. The year before, sorry, thanks, Ed. yes, to, to 2019, where the company called uh, Spa, it's a huge uh, network of supermarkets, actually global, one of actually the most globally uh, spread, uh, according to Wikipedia, uh, network of supermarkets where the CIO is sharing their experience on implementing in productive uh, use of uh, the functionality that we have, we have showcased uh, today. There are other examples that are probably less public. Uh, anyone that is interested is welcome to take contact with us. We could we could actually share in more details that, but SPAR is enough to probably to, to support the thesis. Yeah, that's a pretty big name. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Okay, with that, um, let me thank you both for um, spending uh, your afternoon with us today and um, 
giving us that uh, great insight into what the uh, convergent analytics community is and um, how iris can be used to uh, you know make ai and ml work uh, so thank you for that um, i don't know would you both be willing to uh, join us in the networking lounge for a couple of minutes so that uh, attendees can ask you uh, personally uh, whatever question they might be having. Is that an option? Yes, sure. Sure, just send us a link. So for all the attendees, I'm going to post the uh, link to the networking lounge in the chat window. So feel free to uh, move there and uh, talk to us and um, uh, hopefully uh, we'll meet you there in, in, a, in a few minutes. Uh, with that, let me close the webinar by again saying thank you, thank you, thank you, and uh, I hope uh, you'll tune in back tomorrow for the integrated ML demo. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye.